I am so excited for this because I have been following this creator probably since the very beginning. In fact, we're gonna chat now about how long we've both been on there. This is Dr. Karen Rajan, NHS surgeon, lecturer at Sunderland University, author and prolific content creator. With over 5 million followers on TikTok, his content has helped debunk health misinformation. Brace yourselves, because these are the five worst TikTok health trends of 2022. Shared groundbreaking news in medicine. This is the biggest ever breakthrough for Alzheimer's. Lecanemab is the first drug to actually slow down the destruction of the brain. And recounted some of the weirdest facts in existence about our bodies. Fun, fun fact, there are no laws against cannibalism per se in most places around the world. However, legally obtaining and consuming said human flesh is almost legally impossible. Welcome to Off Platform, the podcast where we find out how content creators create and why. I'm Sophia smith Gaylor, journalist, author and content creator and this episode was made possible with my fellowship at Brown University's Information Futures Lab. I mean, you, you, you seem to do everything, apart from also being a doctor, as well as put out content on everything. So today, that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to find out how you do it on top of what must be an extremely challenging job. So before I carry on, can you maybe just give a bit of an idea of what it is that you do and all the different jobs that you do? Uh, yeah, so I wear quite a few hats. Um, You're wearing, wearing, one, wearing now. one now. Yeah, it's very stressful, <laughs> very heavy on my head. Um, but in terms of the different roles I do, obviously I'm a surgeon. That's my background. I've been training for many years. I spent more than half my life studying in medicine and then postgraduate training. So doctor, surgeon, specifically general surgery. And general surgery, for me... It encompasses so many things, which is why it attracted me to that position in the first place. Everything from bowel cancers to appendicitis to hernias to gallbladder issues uh, to liver issues. So it encompasses a whole range of things, basically everything inside your abdomen and potentially pelvis. That's one of the jobs I do. And then in the last three or four years, another incidental career which popped up was making content uh, or you know quote unquote an influencer although I hate that word I don't see myself as an influencer more hopefully an educator um, and I'm also a dog dad as well that's really important that to add in there so I mean you could have just you could have just stuck to surgery when yeah. you say that content creation popped up as another thing uh, how you know, a lot of people tend to think that when someone blows up online, it's an overnight success. Well, it was a very long night in that case because I started my YouTube channel in 2012 when I was still a medical student. Okay, so we're talking over 10 years ago now. And I had a bit of time and I wanted to help medical students prepare for their exams better. Me and a couple of colleagues made some educational videos, how to do a blood pressure reading, how to do an abdominal examination, etc., etc. That gained a little bit of a cult following on YouTube, 20,000 followers or so. And I neglected that for many years. I got busy with medical school finals, being a junior doctor, etc. And I still loved educating. And then TikTok popped up. And it, or it came on my radar, certainly early 2020. And I thought, interesting, let me, you know, kind of get on this. And I still didn't make content. I was a consumer. And the story goes, I was on call. I was about to do an emergency laparotomy, which is a major abdominal surgery to cut someone in the middle of their tummy, open them up like a suitcase and see what's wrong with their intestines or anything else going on. My junior at the time, we were both waiting for the patient to be put to sleep by the anesthetist. Um, so we had a bit of downtime of 45 minutes or so uh, just to get ourselves ready. And he saw me on TikTok and he said, hey, why don't you make a video? You're always on there. And I thought, OK, I don't really know what to do. He said, why don't you do some weird medical facts? And I did some weird medical facts. You know, did you know that, uh, you know, your stomach acid can dissolve razor blades and so on and so forth? And he said, I don't believe you, but put all those things on there. We put it on there. Went, did the surgery, scrubbed out about three hours later. He said, check your phone. And it was blowing up with all these messages and likes. And I kept doing that. It was my first series on TikTok, Weird Medical Facts. And then, you know, here we are. And that's how it kind of all started. But it originally started 10 years ago with one thing. And I deviated and kind of more educate the public now rather than medical professionals. 
when I speak to content creators, it's almost always a story like that. We think, especially with the age of TikTok and vertical video and people blowing up now, obviously people blew up on YouTube back when it mm. was possible to do that. Um, but they almost always had some grounding somewhere in either digital or storytelling. I love that you've described it as weird medical facts because, I mean, that's still one of your most popular areas of content, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, who doesn't love to just hear an interesting, you know, tidbit or something where, wow, okay, that's a nice icebreaker or little party fact that you can throw up to someone. It just fills you with knowledge and it piques a lot of curiosity. And I never say my videos are a closed loop where someone can learn everything about one thing. It's a you know, a diving board for someone to then go off and do their own research, to pique their curiosity, to pique their knowledge for something. And oh, that's a interesting fact about cannibalism. Let me go and read up about cannibalism. Um, yeah, that that's the, my aim, not to give them a, a complete university. Not to degree. give them a how-to guide. To, yeah, to cannibalism. To cannibalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully not. <laughs> how do you talk me through like the process of how you make this content is it all by yourself do you have a team of people around you to help make it happen um and talk me through the platforms that you're on now so in that order uh, the team is me unfortunately for a couple of reasons i think one of that is my kind of surgical personality surgeons are often notoriously seen as lone wolves they have a very hard time delegating and giving tasks to other people because they kind of want to do everything themselves. Uh, unfortunately, that isn't sometimes always the best because I have a lot on my plate as it is and I would love to delegate more things. But also with uh, an expanding team comes costs as well, which I want to try and keep down. Uh, I don't think I can justify doing all of those things at the moment. And also I, I like you know, looking at everything in minute detail. So editing, scripting, content curation, production, uh, scripting and shooting, that's all me. Very briefly, for my longer YouTube videos, I had an editor, um, but he went off and, you know, made his own content and he was a content creator himself. So, you know, kind of we parted ways amicably and I'm on the hunt for a new editor to help with my YouTube because that's my plan for uh, this year. So I am on... Pretty much every platform. I'm on TikTok, obviously. I'm on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, newsletter, if that's a platform, and also uh, on Snapchat as well. Uh, I ver I've learned over the years with trial and error that each platform, although there will be some commonalities between each platform in terms of what goes viral. A video that gets 50 million views on TikTok will likely do well on every other short platform. That's just the nature of, you know, what people like to see. But there's also differences in that a video which got a million on TikTok may get 10 million views on Facebook or Instagram or get next to no views. There's sometimes, uh, you know, quite glaring differences, but you have to understand some nuances between each platform and you kind of get that with your own experience. There's no, you know, one size fits all rule for what works on Facebook, what works on Instagram, but it's almost for each creator. So I'm in the sort of health science space. I know that actually on Facebook, for example, it's an older demographic. You know, my, if I look at my demographics on Facebook, I get peaks in the 30 plus, 40 plus, and even 60 plus, okay? And those type of people might enjoy slightly more detailed videos which don't rely on clickbaity things or punchy words and titles which might do well on TikTok or YouTube Shorts, for example. And they like some more almost basic down-to-earth thing so you know i can do a video talking about gallbladders and they'll be really interested because they might be suffering with gallbladder issues but tiktok you need to talk about gallbladders in a really clickbaity fun way that has to relate to a younger audience so there are nuances and you grow and appreciate that more time spent on the platform and you reversion content right so like you described it might be the same video going out on several platforms but maybe edited in a slightly bespoke way I usually don't specifically edit them from each platform unless it's not doing well. For example, mm. uh, I often, I never used to do this, but now a video, I don't make videos on TikTok itself anymore. I don't use it using the in-app creation tools anymore. I make it on a camera, on a DSLR camera, so I can have high quality footage, which I can repurpose anywhere instead of downloading really grainy quality from TikTok that's super compressed, have it on my camera. 
And I sometimes will use the native captions in TikTok for TikTok. And I'll use my own caption tool to make captions if I'm posting on Instagram and YouTube. But also on TikTok, more so than any other platform, those first couple of seconds where you hook someone in matters more than reels or uh, YouTube shorts or anything. And I posted a video about the science and evolutionary advantage of bum hair, for example. Okay. And it did really well on Instagram and YouTube shorts of over a million. But it didn't do well on TikTok when I first posted it. It got maybe 40,000 views. And I thought, that's really odd because I really believe in this video. I really believe bum content can do very yeah, well on TikTok. and I've TikTok. proven that. And, <laughs> you know, I thought, this I need to do something. And I just chopped two seconds out. So it kind of cuts to a really clickbaity thing. Instead of saying, you know, because it was a Stitch video of some guy saying, you know what, I really don't understand. I thought in my head that doesn't work because then the next thing he said after, you know what I really don't understand? Bum hair. <laughs> so I just started with bum hair and uh, it got over a million views on TikTok as well after I reposted and re-edited it. There's a part of that story that's really frustrating, mm. isn't it? Do you ever get infuriated with the, the sort of whims of algorithms? You do initially, but the longer you spend on a platform and the longer the time spent being a creator, there's there's a couple of things, uh, routes you can go down. Uh, one route is this audience capture route where you play to your audience, you play to trends, you play to what you think will make you go viral. That may not necessarily align with your own ethos on what you enjoy doing. For example, you could make silly trending dancing videos and accumulate millions of views and millions of followers, but then your audience are following you based on those things that you've done, dancing and singing and whatever else. But actually, you might really enjoy making ASMR content, and you can't do that because your ASMR content doesn't get the views that your singing and dancing does. So you are entranced by your audience to do that certain thing. That's the You've been captured by the audience and by the algorithm to do that. The other route you can go down, and that leads to early burnouts and disillusionment with the platforms because you're thinking, I can't really do what I want. It's like in your career, if you're stuck in a job you don't enjoy, why are you doing it? So that's unfulfilling. That's number one. The other route you can go down is no matter what the algorithm throws at you, the peaks and troughs, you just keep doing what you want. And, you know, like I, like I do, maybe you make slight adjustments here and there to try and optimize as much as you can you know, the video you do, but you have to know that as much as you optimize it, it just might not do well according to the algorithm. But that doesn't make it a bad video. There are excellent creators out there who are yet to be discovered because the algorithm, for whatever reason, doesn't push their content. And they may never blow up and still have excellent content, but that's just the way it goes. What are some of your most viral videos? And are they also the videos you're proudest of? Um, there are a few viral videos that I'm proud of. I I'm always proud of all of my videos. I don't think I've ever done a video that I thought, you know what, I really hate that. I'm disgusted by it. Uh, the only times I say that is my really older videos where I was almost getting to grips with TikTok and being comfortable having my face out there. I sometimes cringe at that and my voice and things like that. But I'm not, uh, not proud of those things. Um, for example, uh, a super viral video I got was something where it was during the peak COVID and peak COVID misinformation on TikTok when people were getting these kind of drive-through vaccines uh, and vaccinations. Um, and a type of um, vaccine syringe that you can get is a retractable uh, needle head. So, you know, you deliver the uh, injection and once the dose is administered, the needle retracts back inside the syringe. And that's a protective measure to stop needle stick injuries. So to stop the um, healthcare worker getting uh, the needle into their skin or an accidental injury uh, to the person receiving the dose of vaccine. It's just like a healthcare measure to redu reduce sharps injuries and things like that. Uh, there are more expensive, those kind of uh, syringes. But to the misinformed anti-vaxxer, it looks like, oh, it's a fake syringe or it's like a not a real one. Oh. oh, the needle's gone inside the person, that sort of thing. And I saw this video where someone had a drive through uh, COVID vaccine in somewhere in South America or in America. And the person gave the uh, vaccine and the needle disappeared. And someone said, oh, my God. And there was really dark music uh, and, you know, it all sort of hyped up. And that got about 20 million views. I stitched that explaining 
and even demonstrated with a needle, hey, this is the needle, this is how it works. It's not, it's a safety mechanism. And let me assure you, you still received it and you can actually see the needle in there. And I've used it before, blah, blah, blah. And that video got about 40 million views. So I was proud of that, that at least it's reached 40 million people. Now, I can't be arrogant enough to assume that 40 million people are gonna take that on board. But even if 0.1% of 40 million people take it on board, that's a big number. Uh, and another couple of videos I've done was, um, one was an illusion video talking about how, you know, your brain tricks you. Uh, and I explained the neuroscience of that. And another 50 million video was on body modification trends around the world. And um, I suspect that got a lot of views because the first two seconds had um, me and my dog when he was still a puppy and he's beautiful. So it might've been that, but it was showing, you know, the foot binding, the lotus feet in China, uh, way back when, uh, certain tribes uh, in Southeast Asia, where, uh, if someone passes away, they amputate one of their digits, uh, and other sort of strange body modification trends around the world and body standards, which people are just interested in. Something that I have to ask you about is your scripting. Yeah. Specifically, how I'm assuming you do this to try and avoid the content sometimes being suppressed on, let's say, a TikTok algorithm. I could be wrong. Um, the puns and the synonyms and the <laughs> double entendres that you come up with different body parts. Is that why? It started off that way because uh, I didn't want to say penis uh, <laughs> repeatedly. If I'm talking about penile fractures, I'll conceivably be having to say penis many times. And, you know, if you did a count of that, it's about, you know, 20 times. So it's more fun and keeps people more engaged if you say, you know, pen 15 or something like that. Or, you know, the floppy pork sword or soggy sausage or whatever, the purple headed cyclops. And it was endless. And actually, I found initially I did it to, you know, duck and dodge the algorithm and the AI censorship. Then I realized people enjoyed it. And it almost became like little Easter eggs within the video of like how many of these weird, uh, you know, words and pontifications can Dr. Curran come up with and these little strange euphemisms. And it kept coming up like that. And it became almost like an in-joke. Um, you can do it for everything from vaginas to penises to bums to sex to anything. And I, and I loved it. And um, now I don't, I, obviously I do it also to, you know, avoid censorship and the video being suppressed. But also I enjoy doing that now because it adds my own flavor. People come to expect that. And actually I had a recent video where I explained something semi-serious about vaginal steaming in uh, women. And uh, someone said, I'm disappointed. There were only one, there's only one pun there. What was the pun? Uh, I said, you know, so vaginal steaming, you shouldn't be steaming your vagina because it doesn't help with endometriosis or period pains. And I explained how it can damage the labia and things like that, steam related damage. And I said, um, you know, <laughs> I think the phrase was your uh, your labia aren't a set of curtains that need to be steam cleaned. Um and or your you know your vagina doesn't need a facial and uh, some some sort of puns like that and um, they were disappointed they want more so how do you monetize your content if you do? I do monetize my content, but I would say I don't monetize it incredibly well. But some of that is down to my career and also personal preference. Uh, I often uh, quote the example that I had about a year back, where so I, I get approached a few times a week, several times a week, both in my junk box and main inbox from several companies asking me to promote or endorse various things, you know, dodgy things, sometimes okay, but it doesn't align with my philosophy or my brand. And uh, one such example was uh, two very large probiotic companies, both international probiotic companies, and you would definitely know them if I told you uh, who they were. Uh, asked me to be their brand ambassador <clears throat> and make, uh, you know, I think the sort of the terms uh, were something along the lines of be our brand ambassador. You know, you post some stories on Instagram and you post a couple of TikToks uh, every month and we give you, you know, it was upwards of 10,000, which is more than my NHS salary. And it's a, you know, very nice offer. And I'm sure a lot of people would take that up. But I've made several videos, including a very long deep dive YouTube video explaining how probiotics are more hype than health. And there's only a very narrow category of people, a narrow category of people with specific conditions 
that it may help medical grade probiotics, not your standard probiotics you can you know pick up from your supermarket. They do next to nothing. It's like pissing in the wind. Uh, and so I, I said, no, I, well, I just ignored it. I didn't say no, I just ignored those emails. And uh, again, similarly, I'll get lots of offers like this and I can't because I'm an NHS doctor and I find that I'm in a position of power and authority in the sense that because I'm an NHS doctor and provide all this knowledge, a lot of people follow me because I debunk stuff, I demyth stuff, and I'm seen almost this beacon of truth and no Okay, if Dr. Curran says that's true, then I'm going to do it. If he says it's rubbish, then it's rubbish. You know, I, for better or for worse, I'm in that position sometimes. So if I hawk something that isn't true just to line my pockets, and I'm doing a disservice to all those people who follow me and maybe people who just watch my content and don't follow me. So, uh, you know, with all in best intention in the world, I need to be very careful about what I endorse. Um, and so far, the kind of brand stuff I've done have been for like, you know, I've done stuff for TikTok to promote their hashtag learn on TikTok back in the day. Um, I've done stuff for some charities, rheumatoid arthritis charities, I've done stuff with the NHS. So there's some stuff I can do if it aligns with my brand, if it's not harmful, if it's science based and not just some misinformation pseudoscience. Um, for example, you know, let's say um, Schmashmetic Schmeens the supplement, if they approach me, I would no way in hell, you know, promote any of their products. But a lot of very well known doctors with podcasts and other health influencers do promote their stuff. And we're talking about brand partnerships there as well. Do you do any of the kind of creator fund, any stuff like that? Creator fund stuff, yeah. So I'm on, on TikTok, there's a creator fund. It's not great. So, you know, I, I would uh, accumulate on a monthly basis, you know, uh, dozens of millions of views um, and I'll probably get a couple of hundred dollars in my uh, creator fund account from TikTok. I mean, it's better than zero dollars, but it's not a lot for the amount of millions of views I'm accruing for the platform. Uh, on YouTube, um, I do a lot of shorts on there. Previously, they had the YouTube shorts bonus which they were randomly allocating to creators based on how many you know views you were getting. Um, I had a couple of good months where they were giving you know a decent amount uh, for that. But also my aim with YouTube is to this year make longer form content, more kind of deep dive documentary style pieces and investigative pieces. And I'm hoping if that does well, that will provide some stable ad revenue. For me, that's the best way that I would like to make money online, where I'm not taking anything from the viewer, um, but I'm taking from the platform. You know, the viewer just commits their time to watching. That's you know all I ask. And obviously, I'm you know I wrote a book, and I can make money from the book. Uh, again, that I spent two years writing that, so you know, charging a nominal fee for people to buy the book, I see it as a fair exchange because I'm not hawking any supplements or any nonsense like that. It's my knowledge that I've spent two years filling in a book, so I think that's fair. If you think about the future of medical content creators, mm. do you worry that there perhaps isn't sustainability there? Because you've just described a model in your own life where you're kind of finding other ways to fund your content creation. Um, and because of your job, you can't take advantage of a lot of these brand partnerships that people in other lines of work maybe can think about those kind of ethics of things a bit less because the stakes aren't so high. We're talking about help people's health here, people's lives. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ethical jungle for a medical science health creator, more a medical creator uh, to navigate uh, the whole brand partnership, um, making money online, creator economy space. Because in the UK, certainly, in America, it's a bit of a wild west. You can do whatever you want. There is no, I mean, there are governing bodies, but it's a bit more, you know, wild west out there. In the UK, the GMC, the watchdog of doctors, they are, they can be very heavy handed and they can really zone in on, uh, you know, doctors who are doing bad things. And even, you know, doctors who may not be doing such bad things, but they have just very, you know, you know, the magnified view of everything that doctors are doing. And you can easily find yourself on the wrong side of the GMC because there's lots of gray areas with social media and being a doctor and being a healthcare professional in the UK. There is a, a worksheet, a sort of guidance for that. It's not been updated for a couple of years and I don't see it as thorough enough in terms of what I've seen, I've seen medical doctors in the UK 
promote all sorts of you know bullshit from uh, smelling pens that suppress your appetite. This is a doctor who works in the you know in the UK promoting this sort of stuff, uh, promoting fat burning pills. Uh, so there's all sorts of nonsense going on, and I think you need to be very careful in the UK. And I, and I worry because. In my generation of doctors who are there, there's not a whole bunch of people who've got an online persona or accounts. But a lot of the medical students now who are in first year of medical school, final year of medical school, almost all of them have social media accounts. And they have creator accounts where they're creating videos like I do. So conceivably, in the next 10, 15 years, we're going to have consultants, so fully qualified uh, consultants at the end of their training with potentially large followings your doctors that you see in your gp surgery might have two hundred thousand on instagram and that might be a common theme and have they read the this guidance mm. that you're describing is that guidance good enough for them in the first place before they read and are they effectively being held to account if they perhaps do something that they shouldn't it's difficult because I would say that most doctors who have a social media account in the UK have not read this guidance. Mm -hmm. And from anecdotal experience, and sp I speak to a lot of creators in the UK who are doctors as well. I've got various groups on WhatsApp and Instagram, and I just sort of sometimes read what they're saying and stuff. And a lot of their understanding of social media comes after being burnt. So, for example... A lot of the guidance, and the guidance is the GMC's guidance, but then there's also specific guidance on social media usage, hospital by hospital, trust by trust. If you're working in one hospital and you take a video of you in your scrubs, recording a video, no patient identification in the background, just in your scrubs, in the hospital environment, that could be against that local trust policy. And you could find yourself in hot water. Wow. The medical director could say, you have to take that video down or you need to take your entire social media down. And that's happened to one of my colleagues who's been on social media. Um, or they get told off because they've got an x-ray in the background which may have the name. Now, that is um, you know, a GMC-able offense. You can't have you know, breach of patient information, especially on social media. So there's all sorts of these little nuances, not just in that guidance, but hospital by hospital. And the kind of the main thing is, you know, if you think it might be wrong, it probably is. Just don't do it. Don't talk about your patient experiences if they've just happened yesterday. You know, if you're talking about a patient experience, change some elements of the history, change some details, you know, so it's completely different. Um, maybe don't do it whilst you're on a busy shift in the middle of a shift, uh, whilst you're needed for something, you know, uh, all sorts of things. But a lot of the time it is trial and error, unfortunately. There are so many parallels to our jobs that I hadn't identified before talking mm -hmm. to you today. Um, but even with that, um, if you're working in news media, a lot of the things you've described, uh, jigsaw identification is a mm -hmm. phrase we use all the time. But if, if you've anonymized someone, someone uh, is entitled to the anonymity, for example, like a patient or maybe someone, hel someone else who's come to me in confidence. I can't anonymize them and, and not tell their name, but tell you basically every single other thing about them so that someone in their lives could identify them. Yeah. I can't do that. Um, uh, and a lot of these standards that hold me to account, it sort of depends where you work in the media space, whether it's print, whether it's broadcast, you're regulated really differently. It's a minefield. Um, and social media stuff is different to how you may be regulated doing other other areas of media. Um, you also said to me just before we started that you've had, you're actually at the end of very intense period of training do you want mm. to talk a bit more about that because it reminded me of an experience i really want to tell you about oh the trauma course I yeah. Went? yeah so you know as a surgeon one of the competencies you have to have is know how to lead and manage uh, a trauma call so for example uh, a patient has been involved in a head-on car collision with a tree you know we can call that rta patient versus tree and the tree one um for example, someone comes in being ejected from the windscreen, polytrauma, so multiple sites of injury from head, broken pelvis, blood in the lungs, uh, bone sticking out of the thigh, etc. You have in. to work out what to treat first. You have to work out what to treat first, but you don't have to almost work it out. There's an algorithm that you have to use in all life-saving scenarios. If in doubt, it's A, B, C, D, E. It's very simple. You know, doctors are very simple creatures. And that's because A is for airway, B is for breathing, 
C is for circulation, D is for disability, so their sort of uh, mental status, if they're confused, etc. E is for everything else and exposure, so you look at all their limbs and everything else. So you follow that thing, because the number one priority is always the airway. If they've got a blocked airway, they're going to die. They can bleed out for a little bit, but they're going to die quicker if you don't sort the airway out. So and you go in that systematic order. And you need to know how to identify different things because, you know, a, a collapsed lung isn't obviously visible sometimes. So you need to identify all those things or blood in the lungs isn't obviously visible sometimes. So you're doing all of that and you need to get recertified almost like, you know, you're, if you're a lifeguard and you need to be, do your sort of swing training or whatever. So being a trauma leader or being able to run a trauma call as a surgeon, you often see trauma. You need to be up to date with that certification. It lasts for four years. So I'd finished my, my previous one. I'd expired. I had to do one again. And it's very intense. And uh, I just had three days of simulated patients with incredible makeup and gunshot wounds to the chest and, you know, fake bones sticking out and it all looks very real and blood in their face and eyes. And yeah, I just finished that today, passed that. So I'm ready to treat more traumas for the next four years at least. And yeah, it was exhausting. So as a journalist, if you do news reporting and it's possible that your employer may one day send you to a war zone or a challenging environment, you do HEFAT, which is hostile environment and first mm. aid training. Um, and the simulated actor thing, we would, uh, a door would open in this kind of warehouse space and we go in and our colleagues who were just in the car in front of us in a war zone may have been stopped at a checkpoint. Um, we're also stopped at the checkpoint and then we're kidnapped um, or we're held at gunpoint or we have to uh, start negotiating with terrorists, for example. Oh. Um, and it, when I did it, was my, it was our security colleagues in the business who are long used to working in these environments were, were pretending to be. Um, you know, the hostile individuals yeah. um, or you suddenly find your, you go into a, um, again, the doors open because they have to prepare the scene and everything. The doors open, you go in and uh, it's a catastrophic event, for example, in the middle of London and you Bomb have to go. or something, yeah. Yeah, and um, not only may you be involved and colleagues may be involved, but you're, the, you're bearing witness. You're a journalist, mm. you are there to bear witness and report on what's happening. And the point of the first aid training is not that we necessarily know what we're doing. It's that we can keep someone alive until they can get someone like you, until they can find medical treatment from a professional. So what you just described, the whole airway stuff, we yeah. had lots of our colleagues sort of uh, play acting different scenarios. Yeah. And we had to say, this is what I have to do. I learned how to do a tourniquet mm. um, if I ever had to do that. And I mean, it was really, it was really scary. We also had have to... Um, we have like a rehearsal for a protest environment if we're reporting yeah. a protest and we're caught between the riot police and protesters, which is one of the most dangerous areas to be in as a journalist. Um, very um, high octane. So I wonder, like, say, for example, you're in the bomb blast scenario yeah. and you see people scattered all over the floor. Yeah. If it, I wonder if it's the same as my sort of field trauma uh, sort of simulation. So we're taught I, I've never seen uh, a major conflict uh, disaster scenario, you know, touch wood, and I, I would like to probably never see one um, in real life. But we're taught in terms of like triage, obviously, it's like a French word that you kind of stratify who's the sickest and who's going to survive, basically. It's pretty savage. If you see someone, you know, lying face down in a pool of their blood without a pulse, and even if they could be, or if they've got a thready pulse and their legs are blown off, we're almost taught that person's gone. Um. You, you try and do something if you can, but actually, you know, you're gone. Move on to the next one. And it's pretty savage because you need to save the one that you think you're most likely to be able to save. If they're kind of hanging by a thread, put all your resources into this person and get them ready rather than compromising that person who you could save. And, you know, and this one who's got like a 2% chance of surviving. So it's pretty savage. I don't know if that's similar to... We would have to do things like go up to people and obviously it's play pretends. There's only... Yeah. They have to kind of narrate a lot of the scenarios. So you'd go up to someone and you'd um, see if they had a pulse and mm. then someone may shout, no pulse. And that's how you... Yeah. You yeah. You, you, you stop trying to help them. Wow. Um, learn how to do CPR, which I'd yes. never done before. Very important. And had I never done that training, I wouldn't... I wouldn't do it so hard. Mm. I now know yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. physicality required. Yeah. And how, if you if you can tag team with someone to very tiring. maintain that force, I never would have known it otherwise. It burns um, your triceps like nothing else. Yeah. And you've got to, with the intention of breaking ribs. W yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, but the training would not have been so good if it hadn't been play pretend. Yeah. It is incredible. We all theoretically know this is a this is an acting scenario. But my goodness, did it feel? I was getting nervous. I was getting yeah, 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 I was yeah. getting scared. Um, I I can I can completely understand when you were telling me about uh, your training. I was like, I can see how that's stressful because even though it wasn't yeah. real, yeah. My goodness, it was good. Yeah, it's really stressful. I mean, I still get um, you know just even aside from doing these simulated trauma things, even every surgery I do before I scrub up, I just get like a little pang, a little uh, you know an electric shock of nervousness when I'm scrubbing. I'm going through the steps of the operation in my mind or the specifics of that operation. I'm thinking, okay, so this person's got, you know, a hole in this part of the bowel. I need to now do this. And I'm going to going through that, rehearsing it, those mental models in my mind while I'm scrubbing. And I'm a little bit nervous and I'm thinking to myself, oh, what if this happens? I need to then envisage that this needs to be done and then that needs to be done. I need to ask the nurse to get out the suction device. So I still get nervous, even if it's simple-ish procedure, I still get nervous but I think that adrenaline is sometimes needed so you focus more and you're more engaged and alert to just little things going on. Your reflexes are at a peak. I'd love to hear your experience, if you have any, with negative comments. Yeah, lo I mean, loads. I think that's the nature of social media is that you'll get a ton of negative comments, usually and thankfully overwhelmingly, you know, over, you know, shadowed by the positive stuff. Uh, but it's human tendency, this negativity bias to, you know, hone in on the negative comments. You get a hundred positive ones and you get one negative one and that's magnified in your eyes. And that's human nature and we can't change those things apart from acknowledging it. And that's part of, you know, changing it. The comments I've got have ranged from anti-vaxxers hating the content I've put out to the point of trying to dox me and you know, cancel me and all these sort of things, which I don't really care about because it's all accurate information I provide to occasional racist comments, uh, which I've even made videos on. And I've sort of called out the user who's used racist terms, you know, uh, calling me uh, a packy or, you know, other various uh, racial slurs. Uh, and I always do it with a sort of point of educating as to why these sort of things, why people are racist or why people troll uh, rather than taking it personally. So I used that opportunity when that person called me a packy to educate the on the kind of the psychology of racism as a learning point to people. Uh, but I think the, the whole point and the ethos and mentality of people who like to troll on social media is it's often never a personal attack. It's just a intrinsic thing they like to toe the line and troll people and you just happen to be a victim. If you take it personally, the troll is one. If you just kind of brush it off, then, you know, the troll loses. Uh, but you can't have social media without trolls. There can be no light without that dark. Um, and for me, I've always enjoyed it. If you're, if you're being trolled, and if you're, you know, getting some hatred from a very small minority of people, you probably are, you know, doing something right or speaking some truth that people don't want to hear. In 10 years time, you may be making content in the way you are now. I imagine there might be a slight difference simply because of how I resign myself to the fact that algorithms change all the time. Mm. But in 10 years time, you look back now at the, the content that you're making, the impact that you're having, what is the general impact that you want your content to have made on people? I started off with the intent of empowering people to take a greater ownership of their own health, especially in the midst of a global pandemic where misinformation was at an all time high and people were scared and science was back to being sort of sexy. And that was my main goal. So people are more confident in almost providing for themselves uh, to some degree, uh, widening access to healthcare to people. I, I feel, I mean, this might sound silly to someone, but actually if, because you know, TikTok and social media are global platforms and global reach is available. If someone can watch a video of mine about hemorrhoids and get a greater understanding about how to manage their hemorrhoids at home instead of the anxiety of going and seeing a doctor, 
and improving their habits as a result, that's great, even if it's just one person. So um, improving people's health on a kind of epidemiological level, hopefully. And the role of social media, because you can't interact with people and give them medication, it takes on a preventative role. You're teaching people about core habits, how to optimize their sleep, how to optimize their gut health, how to, uh, you know, regulate their emotional state and do little tips and tricks to help with anxiety, all sorts of things which I've covered over the years. And even laughter is a sort of medicine where you kind of, if people enjoy the cathartic nature of listening to a story about medical history. So all of these things I see as kind of light preventative measures to just help people uh, and it's in there at the tip of their hands where they can just, you know, have that information, improve their health literacy as well. That's another thing I, I enjoy doing. So I hope actually that's kind of my you know legacy, quote unquote, where people think, OK, there was good information provided there. It did help with my health anxiety. It improved my own relationship with health, improved my relationship with my healthcare professional. So I can actually have a discussion with them on an equal footing. All of these things I think are really important and really underrated. And thank you so much for joining me on Off Platform. Thank you very much. You can follow Dr. Curran all over social media, but if you want even more from him, make sure you check out his brilliant podcast, The Referral, and pre-order his new book, This Book May Save Your Life, which is out in December. For more episodes of Off Platform, make sure you're following me, Sophia Smith-Gayla, on any social media platform. And remember that these episodes are available to watch as well as listen to on YouTube. I developed these episodes while I was a fellow at Brown University as part of a resource I made to help improve online media literacy in the UK for young people. If you're interested in talks or lesson plans full of information like this on content creation, head to my website, www.sophiasmithgayla.com. Thank you for listening and I'll be back next week.